Welcome to Hot Chips 25. Keynote 1. The chip design game at the end of Moore's Law. It's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce my, uh, the next speaker. Um, he's somebody who's been in the computer business for a long time and has lots of interesting stories to tell. Uh, many of you probably know him as the author of the Pentium Chronicles, which is just a wonderful book that gives you a look you know, inside the, uh, uh, the machinations of what arguably is the world's um, you know, most impressive computer maker. Um, I first met Bob when I showed up uh, fresh out of uh, school at Bell Labs, and he was assigned to be my mentor, which may be one of the most difficult assignments he's, he's ever had, but I think I learned, learned a bunch from him um, over that period of time. He then went on and, and uh, got a PhD at, at CMU. He uh, designed some interesting machines at Multiflow Computer, briefly toyed around with the idea of being a professor after that, and, but uh, rejected that and wound up at Intel, where he was the, uh, uh, the principal architect of... Uh, the, uh, the Pentium Pro and the series of machines that, that followed that, winding up being Intel's um, chief architect. Um, he then went and did a bunch of other things, and most recently um, has wound up as uh, director of the Microsystems Technology Office at uh, DARPA, where he's leading a lot of really exciting projects on, on the future of computing. Um, he has uh, some of the most impressive credentials in the field, including being a winner of the Eckert Mockley Award, the highest um, award that a computer architect can aspire to, and is a member of the National Academy of Sciences. And so he's going to tell us uh, how we can stay in the chip design game um, after Moore's Law, or perhaps after Denard's scaling ends. So, Bob? Thanks, Bill. <clears throat> is my mic on? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah sort of. Okay, so um, DARPA. Uh, I first wanted to point out to you what it's like to work in the government. So when I submitted these slides, so the slides have to be approved, right, because, because it's the government and it has to be approved. And so when I submitted this, the, uh, here I gotta get my pointer out. So that DARPA logo was imposed on, the, on this chip, the, this chip thing was all the way to the top and all the way to the bottom. But you can't have that, the DARPA logo has to be separate, see. So, and, and, uh, and, and one of the reasons is you have to be able to read distribution statement A. Oh, by the way, the Intel guys that were given the talk that said Intel confidential on the slides, I noticed that. We, we pay a lot of attention to these things nowadays. Anyway, uh, working for the government, so who, I'm gonna, you'll hear more about that as we go, but uh, I'm mostly here to talk about uh, what I consider to be a, a looming issue, which is uh, the end of Moore's Law. Um, I, was, I was watching a, uh, something on TV not too long ago. It had to do with Peter Pan. Have you guys all seen the show or the play, Peter Pan? At some point in that show, nobody even put their hand up. You guys, what a bunch of geeks. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> At least some of you have seen Peter Pan. Well, so there's a part of Peter Pan that's supposed to be for the little kids. And, the, and where it is is Tinkerbell is this like little light that's flying around. And, and at some point, Tinkerbell gets sick or is poisoned, and it's starting to fade out. And, and all the kids are supposed to go, I believe in you, I do believe in you, Tink, and it gets brighter, and she's okay again. And it struck me that, last time I saw it, it struck me that there's still people that think of Moore's Law that way. If you just believe in it strong enough, you know? <laughs> and and I, unfortunately, I, I think physics doesn't actually care what, what we believe, you know? So, so, so in any case, I think the safest thing to do is, is, is to keep cranking like the, the, the chips that were described this morning I thought were awesome. They were fascinating to look at, you know, the, the sheer number of I.O. Um, protocols that people have to deal with today are just astonishing to me. Um, but, and so we should keep doing that. We should keep designing our, our heads off, but at the same time plan for the future a little bit because it's not that far off. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And, I, and I've got some ideas as to how you might go about doing that um, as we go. So because I'm an old guy, I think of it this way. Um, I still remember when someone handed me a transistor radio in about 1960 which is like, what, two years after the dang transistors were invented, and, uh, and it had six transistors. And, and, and I thought, well, I don't know what a transistor is, but it sure is cool because it makes music come out of this tiny little box. And, and then I thought it was cool until I went to school the next day and discovered that my friend had an eight-transistor radio. 
and, and someone else had a 10 transistor radio. And I'm thinking, there, I don't actually hear the difference, but it must be cooler. So I, because I was a budding engineer, I actually took the thing apart and looked. And sure enough, I could, I don't know what a transistor is, but there were six little, little silver cans inside of mine. And there were 10 or whatever inside of my buddies. And, and I thought, well, that's really weird. And then I started staring at it, and I, and I didn't know how things worked. I didn't know anything about electronics, but I kind of figured that this, the, the, the little wires, they look like wires on the, uh, on the printed circuit board must do something. And, and some of those little transistors didn't have any connections to them. <laughs> and seriously, they didn't. <laughs> and then I thought, what? So I took, this I took this radio to my uncle, who actually was a technician, and I said, what is the deal? How, how can they work without being connected to anything? And he said, this is a, one of life's learning moments. <laughs> those, those extra transistors are not, in fact, even functional. They don't work. That's why they were put in. But it means that they can call them a 10 transistor radio, and certain people will buy them because of that. And I remember, I was six years old. I'm thinking, oh my god, is that how the world's really wired? That's, that's frightening. But that was Marketing 101. So here's 1955, the world's first transistor radio. I don't know how many transistors it had. Um, and nowadays, we have this, this great big, you know, huge chip over here with lots and lots of transistors on it. And, and I also wanted to point one other thing out. We as a society, and I think this is worldwide, although I've only seen Americans do this, um, the higher the technology, the, the more they take it for granted and start to abuse it and get mad if it doesn't work. And I just think that's astonishing. I mean, I remember when I wanted to hear music as a kid, you'd put one of those plastic things on with a little needle, and if you weren't careful, it was going to break, and, you know, your, your parents would hate you. And then nowadays, kids just, you know, they, like cell phones are, are just miracles of technology, as you guys well know, um, and they think nothing of it. They get mad at it for all kinds of different reasons. If there's no reception on top of some mountain somewhere, it's, uh, their expectations are sky high, and, and yet we put up with it because they buy our stuff, so that's a good reason. But anyway, Moore's Law is great. Now, it, unfortunately, I, I kind of hit it in the top corner, but I'm kind of expecting that you all know what that looks like, and I want to remind you of something really important about it. Uh, it's, it's one thing if the rest of the world gets confused as to what Moore's Law means, because they'll sometimes say, oh, it's a doubling of performance, or I don't know, doubling of wonderfulness. But what it really is, is what Gordon was pointing out was, if you're, if you're going to integrate a lot of components on a chip, there's an optimal place on that curve where you should do that. And you can go beyond the optimum point, but it will cost you in terms of uh, price per component that you stuck on there. So what he was saying was, there are sweet spots in these curves. That the bottom, that, you know, the, the local uh, minimum there, that's the sweet spot. And that's where your maximum profit will be, assuming you can sell as many as you can make. So it's really important, don't, don't confuse performance and number of transistors. The Moore's Law is about transistors. It's our jobs to turn that into performance or whatever people want to pay money for. So how we did that, now, so at DARPA, one of the things that we're looking into very seriously is what some people call synthetic biology. We, we prefer to call it engineered biology, but we could argue about whether those are the same or whatever. But, but the idea is, how do you take uh, an incredibly complicated thing and make it do what you want it to do? And so in, in our case, in the silicon industry, uh, we gradually learned what it took to sort of take an incredibly complicated system and crank these suckers out like they're candy, right? That's what we do. Uh, and the difficulty is lost on people because we do it so easily and so routinely. Um, so the, the point is that we learned things. The way we did it was separating the concerns. If, if one human brain had to take into account all of the, you know, the one billion transistors or the five billion I heard about this morning, we're screwed. I've never met anybody that smart. Instead, what I think we do is we separate the concerns and we, we abstract. We, we build up a hierarchy of abstractions and that's the way we deal with complexity. That is a lesson we can teach a lot of other industries. And that's, and that's, in particular, synthetic biology, I think, is waiting to, to hear about that. And I think the same kind of approach is going to help them. Um, one of the things we did not as, as well, so, so the separation of concerns I listed here had to do with, you know, it, com, they're computer specific. But the, what we did was we, com, we used tools. You have to convert, you know, the relationships between these various, you know, areas or various hierarchies into, into something that a tool can help you check and help you can, uh, monitor. So that's another message that we have to give these guys. Um, and I just wanted to point out, since I'm pointing to the end of Moore's Law, CMOS was re really good stuff. <laughs>
CMOS, you can't really beat CMOS. It's, it, so I've, we keep looking because we're DARPA, we're supposed to be you know, looking down the road and so on. Uh, there ain't much down that road so far. We, we, the list of, of technologies that might compete with CMOS has got maybe 30 elements on it, 30 different kind of things. And on that list, my, my personal take is there's about two or three that are really promising at all, and they're not very. It's just hard to beat CMOS. So we'll talk some more about that in a minute. After Moore's Law, it was after, I saw the electronics before Moore's Law. There was an industry, people made stuff, you could do it. And so after Moore's Law, I, my, my prediction is the same thing's gonna happen. We're not just gonna quit. But let's at least face the fact that this is an exponential and there cannot be an exponential that doesn't end. Can't happen. So with the, my, my example here, what that is is a chessboard with rice on it. If you guys heard the story, it's just an illustrative tale of somebody that impressed the emperor and the emperor somewhere and, and the emperor said, I'll give you anything you want, what do you want? And the guy said, chessboard with one grain of rice on the first square and twice that many on the second and twice that on the third. And the emperor said, okay, guy wants some rice, give it to him. But without realizing that if you actually take two to the 64th, that number is so big, it's unbelievable. As you, you don't, there is not, there's never been that much rice in the universe. So that's, that's an exponential. Trees don't go to the sky is what the economics people say. That's their phrase, but it's the same thing. Exponentials cannot continue forever. So you have to, you have to wonder when they're gonna end. So electronics, we saw that before Moore's Law, we're gonna see it afterwards. Let's just talk about what world life will be like then. Well, first let's agree on what the algorithm is we've been following. This is the algorithm that I think uh, that I tried to follow mostly at Intel. The only thing I left out of that algorithm was uh, fab capacity. People, like if you own a big fab, the biggest thing that you hate in life is the prospect that that fab will be empty or not run full because that almost costs you the same as if it runs full. So then your temptation is very strong to crank something through that fab, whatever it is. Uh, you don't want it to be empty. But if you can achieve that, then the algorithm that you want is to make you know, huge unit volumes, you want really high yields, and you want uh, high profits, that's, what you're gonna, that's what's gonna give you that. And, and so the bottom line, and they teach you this in Economics 101, although it's probably pretty obvious, people need a reason to give you their money. And so a, a chip designer's job is to give them that reason. So I've talked to lots of people in the Department of Defense and elsewhere about, you know, are you prepared? What do you think is gonna happen? When, when Moore's Law ends. And by the way, I, I'm thinking of, for, for planning horizons, I pick about 2020 as, as, as the earliest thing where I think we could call it dead. And that's only seven years away. Um, and, that's, and I'm picking seven nanometers. Uh, I don't, I, you can talk me into 2022. You might even be able to talk me into five nanometers, I don't know. But you're not gonna talk me into one nanometer. You're not gonna talk me into femtometers or whatever. Uh, I think uh, physics dictates against that. So is it a big deal? It is, I think so. I think so. I don't think there's ever been a technology development exponential like this one. Uh, oh, and I've also heard, so Ray Kurzweil in particular is sort of, uh, he's, he goes down a different path and he says, no, 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 no. Moore's Law is just one of a set of exponentials over history. Uh, it's just the latest one, don't worry about it. Uh, and I, I say, baloney, I don't, I don't agree with you at all. I think there haven't been five, I think there's been one and this is it. So. Um, the, the way I think, the, the way I thought of Chip Architect's job in, in, in context with Moore's Law was to stay out of the way. Uh, the idea was if nature's going to give you this bounty of lots more transistors, oh, and they're all faster, oh, and they're lower power, don't fight it. Find a way to design the machine so as to leverage that fact rather than try to be clever and sort of just sort of blow that, pink, blow that off. I think that would have been a um, strategy for failure. So for example, you'd push, we, what we did at Intel when I was there was push on the clock, make sure we didn't sort of fall behind on that because that gives you a direct leverage, at least back in the day it did. Uh, we did pay attention to microarchitecture, but the way I thought of it was microarchitecture in the sense of don't get in the way of the rest of the, of the silicon. Don't, you know, that, that was number one. Once you'd done that, see if there was other things you could do that were clever and would buy you some more performance. I'm not saying microarchitecture has no place. Um, but the way, the way I view it, the scorecard over the last, say, 35 years, um, I figure, well, 1980, uh, Bill, Bill and I were both at Bell Labs designing a, essentially a one megahertz uh, processor, 32-bit processor. Um, today, clocks are running about 3,500 times faster. And so I think it's entertaining to sort of consider what did we architects bring to the table on, in terms of pure architecture, microarchitecture ideas like pipelining or superscalar or you know, caches and all the stuff that we threw in relative to just the plain clocks plus you know, large number of transistors. 
And I think the score is we came out way on the short end of that stick. I think the uh, silicon gave us way more than the architects could, could have made up for. Why that matters, uh, aside from getting yelled at from the, uh, Regina Dugan was the pre previous head of DARPA. And at some point I said much these same words to her. And she said, well then you wasted your time professionally for many years, didn't you? And I went, <laughs> I choose not to view it that way, okay? <laughs> But, I, but, but, the, but aside from personal pride, the, the, the question is if, if the fundamental energizer bunny uh, silicon engine stalls out and we have to resort to being clever in only microarchitecture without additional transistors, how much runway is left? Uh, and I'm saying, yeah, we're going to go down there, we're going to do the best we can, but don't expect 3,500x. There's nothing like that on them. I, I don't see that remaining. Um, all right, so can we continue to crank out successful new chips? What if the, you know, you, you could ask the question, well, sure we can if, the, if you can find enough goodies to bucket them all together and say, okay, maybe, the, maybe Moore's Law left and I don't have as many transistors, but I'm a clever person and my new machine is 50% better than the old one in performance or power or something. I would say 50% is pretty good. You can probably find a market for that. Um, how about 20%? How about 10%? How far down are you willing to go and still think that you've got something you can sell? I think that's the future that we have to contemplate seriously and try to avoid because I don't think the world's going to give a whole lot of um, extra money for a 10 percenter in general. Oh, so here's an, here's an example. I picked this off the internet. And I, I, unfortunately, in um, DARPA's zeal to give everything the proper attribution down here, they replaced the person's name with, with the column, but you'll, you'll find it. This was a, uh, one of those letters to the editor kind of things, the comment column. It's usually a lot of junky stuff down there, but, but this at least was crisp about what the attitude was. It says, ultimately, I think Moore's Law will never stop. Computers, computer builders will find other methods to make their computers faster. And I think, well, that's at least a, you know, I'm, I'm happy for your optimism. I actually think that there's some truth to that for a short time. But the problem is that the low-hanging fruit has is, is already been taken, um, and the amount of effort it's going to take to sort of do anything beyond that is going to be substantial. And you cannot, in my personal opinion, you cannot make up for a lack of an underlying exponential. Those, those fixes will last us a few, we'll, we'll, we'll play all the little tricks that we still didn't get around to, we'll make better machines for a while, but you can't fix that exponential. It's, a bunch of incremental tweaks isn't going to hack it. So partial truths. Well, so, Mark Bohr's a smart guy. He's a, he's a, a, a high-level guy at Intel, and, he's, and he points out, you know, Moore's Law, yeah, yeah, we hear it's going to end all the time, and it's always 10 years away. Um, yeah, sort of, and I think that's partially true, but uh, the part about always 10 years away, I don't agree with. I like this one. The computers we have seem okay to me. Can we just keep on using those? Do they have to keep getting better? I really like that. <laughs> But the reason I like that is I think, isn't it interesting that, that if more, so if, if you accept my premise that Moore's Law is going to end at some point, then you can play the mental game and you can say, well, Bob thinks it's 2020, but what if it had happened in 2010? What if it had happened in 2002? We wouldn't have smartphones. Would we ever have known we wouldn't have smartphones? Would we have been longing for the thing we can't build? Well, if that's true, then we, when we get to 2020, we'll know what it is we can't build. And I actually think we're not very good at that. I, th I think it's more like um, this person wanted to go back when telephones had to plug in. But I think the real thing is we tend to build things and then find out people, what people want to do with them. It's, there's a strong sense in which if you put technology into the hands of people, they're going to surprise you with what they end up doing with it. And you'd better react to that. You'd better learn from that surprise and follow it. Because it's, you can't really technologically dictate to people very well over the long term. Over the long term, they get what they want. And it'll probably be some competitor who delivers it to them if it's not you. So there are things we can do. I'm not saying that all the roads are blocked. There's, there's things, in fact, we should work on some of this, and I'm sure you'll hear some of this in the course of this um, um, uh, conference. For example, 3D stacking, we can do a better job of packaging. We, we're, we're already looking at things like where memory should go, how it should be organized, how do you keep yields up, what do you do about the power. Um, cooling and battery life, I was somewhat bemused at how many questions this morning were all about the power. It's all about thermals. It's, it's uh, very telling. Uh, I think we've gotten to this point of maturity to where that is our biggest demon and that that's what we have to face down if we want to keep going. Um, there's plenty of room to, to improve on software. Um, I mentioned microarchitecture. I threw an architecture, I'm not even sure why. I actually don't think the world cares about instruction sets anymore, uh, if they ever really did. Um, but there's plenty of room for I.O. and there's sure plenty of room for memory because that's still a first order impact on the performance. Um, you can always write new apps. It's kind of fun. A lot of people do. 
Uh, apparently, you don't have to set the bar as high in terms of software quality either. And that wasn't a very big bar. <laughs> so, uh, oh, by the way, as in my DARPA role, I have twice now had a, a two-star or higher general tell me, take out a smartphone and say, look, pal, you see this? See all these apps here? That's what military software should look like. It should be cheap. It should be readily available. I, I, I get it when I want it. Uh, and it doesn't cost me a jillion dollars like the stuff that I have to pay for. And I said, you know, <laughs> If you ever actually got that vision, you would hate it. What, would you stick it in the cockpit of an F-35 and expect it to fly, really? It's, it, no concept that software is not just software. There's actually effort has to go into this stuff to make it really work. Um, I'm putting resilience up here, but I grade it out because, because of, essentially because of a lesson that I learned when I was at Intel. One of our marketing guys once, I was, I was arguing to him at one point, that in the middle of that alpha particle off the lid scare, do you guys remember that? In about 1997 or so, some of our packages ended up with you know, uh, radioactive lids. And funny thing, you stick that next to the silicon and it starts to misbehave. So some of our process guys at Intel came to the architects and said, you know, we often come and tell you that you know, we're scared about something or other and you might have to fix it. But in this case, it's really serious. So you need to be ready to jump in and save us if the soft error rate is as bad as we currently think it is. And I said, really? Okay, well, how bad is it? And he gave me some number and I said, holy hell, it's gonna, it's gonna fail about every three minutes. It, what? what? What, what's causing that? We don't know, but you know. I said, well, geez, if it's that bad, then we're gonna have to tripl replicate the buses and we're gonna have to check all the results. I'm gonna end up with a machine that spends three times the hardware to get one extra performance. Who's gonna buy that? And then, so then we ended up in this discussion after a couple hours or more uh, discussion. And he said, look, you walk into Fry's Electronics, your laptop is sitting here, your competitors are sitting there, and some random buyer is gonna walk up and walk to top, type at one and type at the other and pick one to buy. Now, how do they know which one to buy? And he said, if, if, they, if it's flashy and got graphics and the other guy keep, can't keep up, we know how to sell that. That's, that's something sellable. But if it's resilience and you say, look, mine's only going to fail once out of every 20 years and his is going to fail every once out of 15 years, nobody's going to care. And, and even, if it was way, even if it was 10x, they're not going to be able to stand there and convince themselves it's worth the money you're charging. So he said, resilience is important, but only to, you have to exceed some minimum threshold of expectation. Once you're beyond that, people don't care. There are businesses that do care. Military is one of them. But I'm just saying in terms of commercial, uh, you know, consumer electronics, that's a tough sell. We may have to get serious about that one if the silicon isn't as good as it has been when we squish down to seven nanometers. So I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying it's a tough sell. Um, alternative switches I already mentioned. I wish we had some better candidates right now, but we don't. Um, we've got some programs running at DARPA. I just thought I'd throw in a, a plug uh, for people that are helping us with those. Um, the, and the whole idea there was drive uh, conventional technology as far as we can think to drive it, and then see if there's anything out beyond it. Like, you know, uh, some approximate computing, for example. There's, there's, a, there's a bunch of ideas out there that are floating around we need to look at. Um, better system interfaces. Uh, I think this still having keyboards is just nutty. Uh, it's, we're kind of just used to it. There's got to be something better than that. Pe people, we don't react to each other with keyboards. We, you know, there's... We need to do better on human interfaces. Oh, marketing. So when, when this business gets desperate, this is the kind of thing you start to see. <laughs> do you guys have these? I actually have these dolls at home still. Uh, for one Christmas, they were a hot item, but strangely, not anymore. Anyway, the point is, the, there's a lot of money here. And when necessary, it, I know that at least at Intel, they will try to market their way around a problem. Uh, and, it, and don't laugh at that, it works. So, you, you know, it's, you, you, my prediction, you heard it here first, my prediction is you're gonna see some of this. Um, so, illusions. I also think CMOS has been really good at giving us an illusion. And, and because of that separation of concerns I mentioned earlier, there were whole strata of people, of engineers, whose job it was to maintain that illusion so that we, at like the architecture level, could pretend that there were ones and zeros, for example, and that, that, that uh, things happened in the right amount of time. Um, metastability, for example, I was at Bell Labs, one, it was, this was 1979, and my boss came, Bill and I were both in this microprocessor design group, we were turning out really bad microprocessors. I don't think it was our fault, but it's the truth. And, and my boss came and he said, I heard about this thing called metastability, go check it out. So I went and started reading Mead and Conway, which was brand new at the time. And there was a whole chapter in there. And it basically said, uh, yeah, you're going to have metastability. And no, you can't do anything about it. There's, you can ameliorate it to an extent, but you can't make it go away. And I thought, that's a fairly shocking answer. So I took that back to the boss and said, well, what do we do? And they said, we should have multiple stack D flops and so on, so we can sort of cut the odds down. 
And he goes, oh, we can't afford that. That would, that would increase the latency on interrupt. And I said, well, it's better than not taking the interrupt at all when you're supposed to. Uh, it was really weird. It was, so, so we went through this learning curve uh, and associated with that. I don't want to just pick on metastability. It's always going to be with us. But the point is that the electronics part, the, as we drive uh, power up, uh, speeds up, signal to noise gets worse, there's, there's all of these electronics issues are still there. And as long as they can maintain the illusion, they will, but there may come a time when they can't. And so and we may, we'll have to know about all of these. Dijkstra said, if you can't read it, Dijkstra said, separation of concerns is the only technique for effective ordering of one's thoughts that I know of, which I think is a reasonably succinct way of saying it. Um, and I know that when, when I was working on chips at Intel, it was extremely handy to sort of just bucket things off to the side, say, the cache is over here, it's that size, it does that, I'm going to forget about it at that point. I.O. is over here, and as long as I know the bandwidth, I'm going to forget about it, and I'm going to concentrate on something else. Um, nowadays, I think that as we approach the end of Moore's Law, we're going to find it's harder to do that separation of concerns. You will have to take more things into account as you go. Power is the obvious one. Uh, when, when we did the original Pentium Pro, uh, we knew it was going to be in the 20s for wattage, worst case, and that's all. We didn't care. It was like, you know, we, we knew that that was within a safe range. When we did the Pentium 4, on the other hand, uh, we knew that it was going to be on the order of 80 or 90 watts, which isn't in the safe range. And so we, we couldn't substantially exceed that without really upsetting the apple cart. Uh, so the point is now we can't ever put it out of our minds. We, now we had to design everything we were doing before with that constraint also applying to what we were doing. It makes it a lot harder to do. So, oh, I wanted to mention the 432 in here because it is an example. So it's a really old machine, and I don't expect anyone in here except for me to remember what the heck was in that thing. <laughs> and Mark, look, think of all the wasted neurons. But actually, there were some interesting parts about that machine. It was an object-oriented, capability-based machine, and there were some interesting aspects of capabilities that would have prevented script kiddies from doing hardware ha or software hacks for all these years. Nevertheless, the thing that, that was most striking about the 432 when you tried to use it was you couldn't think of it in terms of horizontal abstractions. You didn't think of it as a horizontal layer of an operating system on top of a horizontal layer of an architecture with a horizontal layer of microarchitecture. You had to look at it vertically with all, this, all the things at once. But if you ever got all those things paged into your head at once and you did this vertical strip, it suddenly made perfect sense what they were trying to do. It really did. It was, it was a, there was an element of beauty to what they tried to do. They, they completely botched the implementation. And that was partly because this technology just wasn't good enough at the time. But in terms of, the, of what the con concept was that they were trying to hit, it was actually really cool. Um, but the point of it is, it partly died, I think, because so few people were willing to sign up and page all that stuff into their heads at once. And it would also because it was, it was completely alien to what most systems look like, and it wasn't clear what you were going to get back for it if you dove in and, and sort of tried to do this. So anyway, oh, RTL correctness is still just as hard as ever, as far as I can tell, because uh, we keep scaling up our ambitions. Uh, I used to worry about bugs like crazy, because I was in charge of pre-silicon bugs um, on the chips that we did. And there were, you know, you remember the FDIV flaw? That was an example of a bug that made it into the wild that, that made a mess, and that was only five million parts. You know, it's, so my recurrent nightmare was always, you know, we're, we're planning to ship 200, 300 million parts, uh, and then we find the FDIV flaw. If you had to do a, rec a recall on that level, I don't think you have that much money. I don't think anybody does. Uh, it's going to be a real mess, and that, that problem's going to continue. Uh, the cool thing is, since I've been gone from Intel for, what, 13 years now, um, I haven't seen any massive recalls by them or anyone else. So I think, well, they're still managing to get by, and that's really good. So uh, I'll keep worrying, but so far, so good. All right, so my proposition to you guys for today is, um, in the future, we, are, we as designers are going to have to care about neighboring technologies, things that we previously kind of put off to the side and hoped would come along later and someone else would have to deal with them. Um, I think we have to absorb more of that in terms of the overall value proposition. Um, it's, it's analogous to what Intel was trying to do with the Intel Inside campaign, if you remember that. They were trying to convince people that, you know, yeah, you bought a computer and it was in this big box, but the only thing that really mattered was that chip in there that said Intel on it. That's the only thing you really care about. That was a marketing campaign that cost them a lot of money. And for a while there, at least Intel thought it was successful. I wouldn't know, but I mean, they, they kept doing it. Uh, but the idea was, the intention was to get the buyers, the people paying money for that system to associate the value with your part of it. Because if you can get into that, uh, that position, it's, uh, it's pretty handy. Um, from Apple, 
um, the, I think Apple, the, the thing that impressed me about Apple and uh, MP3s was they understood that iTunes was, the, was part of it. People didn't actually know how to take CD-ROMs home and burn them or, or to um, rip them and put those things onto a player. We had an MP3 player at Intel. It had twice the capacity of anyone else because we were making the flash chips ourselves. Uh, no one bought it because the only ones that were willing to do the ripping was us. Um, oh, and this always impressed me too, the white earbuds thing with the, the original uh, iPad, iPods. If, if you ever noticed that, it's, it's become a marketing, sorry, it's become a business um, class item at this point. Because before that, people all made them flesh colored because you weren't supposed to like, they looked like hearing aids or something and people didn't want to be, they didn't think they looked too cool. And, and somehow Steve Jobs understood that if you make, you can go the other way, make them stand out, put them on the heads of celebrities and suddenly boom, you know, everybody wants them. Uh, and I think as chip designers, we think, yeah, that's kind of weird. That's like those dancing bunnies, who cares? That doesn't apply to me. I'm suggesting that it does apply to you. <laughs> and you better, and we're, in the future, we're gonna have to be very careful about what we include and what we exclude when we design things. Uh, and it requires, of course, expertise beyond just knowing how to put gates together and worry about bandwidths and things like that. So here's my, my examples of things that I think are neighboring technologies. Communications, biology, is, which I think is gonna be an emerging one, uh, physics and materials, and control theory. And by control theory, I'm talking about if you stick processors in there that are watching for power, power excursions, uh, you know, shifting power back and forth, you, may, you, wanna, you have a control system when you do that, and you wanna make sure it's a stable one. Because if it goes unstable, it's gonna get real entertaining. Uh, and then there's gonna be things that I haven't thought of, but I didn't, I didn't mean no one else, but things I haven't thought of. Um, so communication, it's obvious at this point, everything communicates, pretty much everything. I don't know if there's any, any counter examples. Um, and in the, in the old days, the fastest processor would win. Nowadays, you, you kind of want to know the end application because that will tell you what the ratio is of how important is my communication in terms of bandwidth, reliability, standards, and so on, relative to whatever else I stick into the machine. There's always going to be a balance, more of one, less of the other. Um, so of course, you have to know comms theory. We, we, we teach this to double E's. I don't think that's a surprise. But I think there's a message in it. If you talk to the comms people, I get a kick out of their attitude. Their, their attitude is, of course things make mistakes. Everything makes, there's always errors. There's always bit, there's, a, there's an error in, in a bit stream. The question is, what are the, it's just probability. So you wanna match your machinery to the probability. And, and I go, yeah, but there's an entire industry of people over there in Silicon Valley designing these chips with a billion transistors on them. And every one of them, they think every transistor is gonna work perfectly every single time to a first order. And they go, well, that's nice. You know, someday you'll grow up. <laughs> and, and I think, well, if we can keep getting away with it, we should keep doing it. But we should keep, keep an eye out towards that day when, that, when we don't get away with it anymore. And we have to actually start putting in active um, fixing like the communications people have done all along. Now, neighboring techniques, this is a physics and bio. Um, so there's, there's a lot of brain machine interfacing work going on right now. Some of it is of the intrusive variety. Like this picture down here, this woman is in Pittsburgh. Um, and on the top of her head that you can't really see are two standard parallel connections and they plug straight onto the top of her skull. And she, she can't move anything except for her eyes and her, she can talk and she can think fine. There's nothing wrong with her brain. It was a, there was a disease involved. That, uh, there's a robot arm here holding a chocolate bar that she picked up and she's feeding herself with it. And she's doing that via that interface on her head. Um, that is an example of an interesting interface, but it's fairly, there's not a lot of people that will benefit from that directly. Uh, because it's kind of an invasive thing to go in through your head. That A. B, it doesn't last very long. It lasts months to a year, and then they have to do it again because unfortunately your body thinks that's a foreign thing, and it tends to con uh, surround the electrodes with stuff that diminishes its electrical capacity. Um, so we're working on that. It's, there's, there's, um, there's lots of projects going on that are intended to fix that. My office in particular has one that tries to achieve the same thing, but using the nerves that used to work you know, that used to do things in your arm. I don't think it would happen in her case, but like for a wounded warrior that lost an arm, uh, those nerves still exist somewhere. That can, it's a conduit from the brain and, and also the proprioception ones come back the other way. So we can find those, we can identify which one goes with which finger and so on. And then we can reroute them to a chest muscle and interface to that. And that works really well so far. And, and of course, if that gets messed up or whatever, we can replace it a lot, a lot easier than with the head. So there's a lot of work going on in brain machine interfacing. Um, it's not that I think that this conference is gonna jump with both feet into the human interfacing. This is an extreme example, 
But I am saying that in general, I think the peop people that figure out better interfaces, like I think the Connect thing that we saw this morning, I think that's an example of a better interface for the application. And people that think of those and find them and sort of push on them, I think are going to win. Uh, electronics at the meso. When I, met, when I said physics, I was thinking of that. Meso is, is a scale. Uh, if you go all the way down to a single atom, you're talking quantum mechanics. And if you go up to you know, a billion atoms, you're talking classical mechanics. Somewhere in between, call it 100 to 1,000 atoms, some, there's some interesting physics there. You can make some very interesting things at that level. And so my suggestion is pay attention to those. For example, you can make uh, inertial measurement units. You can make the equivalent of a gyro. Um, you can make uh, uh, some really interesting time bases. Um, you can do focal plane arrays. There, there's, there's some very cool stuff happening down there. Um, in the end, I, my, so my, my, my basic attitude is, in the end, if you want to know what's going to happen, follow the money. And it's, it's not meant cynically. It's meant, that, it's meant to remind you of how expensive this business is to be in. Uh, it's, if you, if you want to keep playing, then somebody is sponsoring you and your design team uh, to the tune of billions of dollars and if you're at a place like Intel. Um, and they're putting that bet down because they're hoping that it's going to pay off and bring billions more back the other way. Uh, if that fails to happen, they won't let you keep playing indefinitely because they can't. Um, I would also point out that I personally believe that, well, I think I said this next. Oh, don't forget this part. Um, I think the end of Moore's law opens a door to designing special purpose things again. In the past, uh, well, if you go back as old as I am, if you go back to the 70s, you could make specialized processors, like floating point systems had a vector array thing that just did vectors. Um, nowadays, uh, on a smaller scale, you could imagine you and your best friends getting together and designing specialized processors that you could expect to give you, say, two orders of magnitude over what anyone else can do, because you only do one thing and you do it really, really well. Um, in the past, had you tried to do that, uh, you might have succeeded, but it might have taken you four years to do, in which case the general industry would have done two turns of the wheel and caught back up to you for free. And so the, you know, that, was, that was kind of a, a very difficult aspect of all the people that were trying to do neurological, uh, sort of neuromorphic chips in the 90s, was every time they finally finished their silicon and got it working, the general purpose chip came along and could simulate faster than they could run, uh, and which killed the value proposition completely. So, my proposal is watch out for opportunities. There may be some that says, hey, if the general purpose community in terms of CPUs, GPUs, the big, the big chips, if they find their way stalled because of the, you know, an end of the Moore's Law uh, tra train, that may mean that there's still uh, some, some performance left over that you could go after if that's all you care about. And it might be a business opportunity. However, if you do that, please don't design something you can't program. That's, there, that has happened so many times in our industry, it's, and it's embarrassing. I mean, it's, we should be past that, so let's not do that anymore. Um, and my suggestion is when Moore's Law ends, I actually think it's not going to be the physics. Everybody sort of concentrates on how many atoms there are, how thick is the oxide, you know. Um, and those things matter. I'm not saying that they don't, but, but my suspicion is because there's so much money involved in this industry, and so, it costs so much to keep playing, that that's what would, fit, would break first. So as an example, I, used to, I usually throw up my big Moore's Law chart. I, I did not inflict that on you today. But had you seen it, what, what, you, what it would have told you is, uh, at least the way Intel did things, we would design a great, big, fat, hot flagship. We didn't call it that at the time, but that's what it was. And, and then we would sell you know, a couple million of those. And those were cool, but they were sort of tolerated. They were tolerated within Intel because um, they were necessary to get to the parts they really wanted to get to. So, for example, the original P6 chip, we, we sold three mil, the Penny Pro, we sold three million of those at about a thousand bucks each. So, okay, three billion dollars over, I don't know much, a year and a half. You might think, well, that's not a terrible business, but, it, but in terms of Intel's business, it ain't so good. What they cared about was the fact that that chip exists, they can now translate that onto a new process technology and then do it again and then do it again. And I can tweak it a little bit each time, but not, not a whole lot because those teams were way smaller, had way less time, and basically didn't have the original architects with them. So they didn't push as hard. They, they, they shouldn't have, and they didn't. Um, and, they, and what they were doing was cranking out the parts that really made the profit for the place. Those were the chips that were profitable, was, those, was all the proliferations. So the point is, if, if, you, if you start designing a flagship at seven nanometers, you may or may not care about how many of those chips you sell at seven nanometers if you're at a place like Intel and you're designing a flagship-style machine. Um, both of those are assumptions. 
But what you do care about is, can I proliferate this to five nanometers and make a hell of a lot of money there? And if the answer turns out to be no, suddenly my interest in seven nanometers has gone down. That's the fundamental, that, that's what I mean by economics. You have to take, you have to step back from the silicon and whose chip is faster than whose and say, who's, where's the money here? Where's the, how are you gonna make a profit at this thing? And, and that's because that's whoever makes the decisions at a high level, that's what they're thinking. They, at one point, uh, I, I asked Andy Grove something equivalent to this. And he said, hey, look, if I could make jelly beans and make more of a profit than CPU chips, I'd do it. He says, we're, we're here to make a profit. We, we answer to the stockholders. And that's wearing the chips because that's what we're good at and that, that's a profitable thing. But if that changes, we'll switch. And I thought that's pretty important. I, I have no doubt that he was exaggerating to make a point, but I think there was a point in there. All right. So that's the end of, the, of what I came to say today. Uh, but I really like this cartoon, so I thought I'd share it with you. Uh, so if you're a geek, you'll know what this, why this is funny. <laughs> and if you're not, I can explain it. But I'm just... <laughs> so uh, any questions? That's, that's, that's my pitch. Any questions from anybody? Thank you. <laughs> Sir. Given how much it costs to keep playing in the game, and given that it will end at some point, uh, you'll probably get to a point where it becomes very, very difficult to uh, get to the next node for some companies. So do you think that this will be kind of frozen in, in time where some companies will be stuck at, say, 10 nanometer, maybe uh, Intel at 5, and some of the other guys at, you know, still at uh, 20 nanometer? Or do you think everybody at some point will get to the latest technology node? I actually think it isn't going to matter. I mean, I, I think as we keep going down, the, the benefits of going from generation N to generation N plus one are getting smaller. There's not like the good old days. You could count on a solid, you know, 40, 50 percent kind of numbers when, when, the, when you went to the, actually look at the specs of these transistors. But when you get down to, you know, 11 nanometers, seven, five, it's not as good. And so they, they start getting closer together in some sense. Um, plus, if you take these chips apart and look at them, you have to really start wondering, <laughs> what do they mean by a 22 nanometer trans or, or technology? And, and some, we used to do a little bit of that at Intel. You'd, 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 you'd look at the actual technology and say, wait, I, you called this whatever the heck it was at the time, you know, 0.6 microns. And, and, and yet you actually look at the transistors and, and geez, they're not really, are they? And sometimes they would play half, half generation games. I actually think that it's going to come out in the wash. Uh, if, if, if Let's put it this way. This is pure instinct. I have no data behind this uh, and no, no special insight here. Uh, what I'm saying is, my, but what my gut is, is I doubt that you're going to find a, an, a stasis at the end of Moore's Law where one company is preferentially advantaged over someone else based on the silicon. I, 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 it, it, this industry doesn't really work that way. Sooner or later, the tricks, they, they, they move around. People, people learn. Everybody's smart, they all figure it out. So my suspicion is we're all going to reach the end point. Maybe not at the same time, but pretty close. Um, hi, my, my question is about, um, you know, there have been arguments over the years that there's a, that there's a sweet spot in the economics of, of semiconductor process where there's, a, you know, like an ideally cost-effective uh, process size to build. And of course, that's as you know, high K dielectrics and stuff have come in to, to solve our latest problems. That you know, that number keeps on going down to smaller and smaller processes. Do you see a situation where, when we do hit the brick wall of process, that there'll be some back off from there? You know, just because of um, you know that because an earlier, a slightly larger process is going to turn out to be the most economically viable mm -hmm. uh, size over time, you know, to build. Wouldn't surprise me a bit. Uh, I would say, though, that in order to get to the most advanced nodes, people have to make huge investments in tools inside the fabs. And once having made those investments, they're highly motivated to get them to work and to get the payoff. <laughs> so. Um, I think it's going to be a mixture of both. I, I think the guys that make that, that are for, like Intel, that are forced to make those leading edge investments, um, they're going to be heavily weighted towards making that pay off. But it doesn't mean that people that are on one generation older than that can't do just fine. I mean, after, as I said, I think the differences between those, uh, those leading edge technologies is too small to be uh, overwhelming at that point. You, you'll be able to compete. That's my, that's my guess. Todd Sir. Biznick. So 
it was in your slides and you didn't say anything about it. Um, when we look at transistors and we look at the small signal or analog model, we can do a massive amount of computation with just one transistor. And, and that seems like an inflection point in, in Moore's ideas. So what have you seen that's compelling in going back to analog compute, but using the new VLSI technology we have today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, well, so, so I would, the only thing I would quibble with the question is the, the word compute. Uh, so we have a program, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean in a second. We have a program at DARPA uh, called Upside, and part of that is looking at unconventional computing technologies. And we do call it that, but in my mind, I always reverse the name, or there, I change that word. To me, computing means running instructions. If you don't have a processor that's running instructions, I, I want to I call that computing. But if you're doing the computing equivalent... Computing means answering a question. Well, okay, if you want to define... Uh, I would use a different word, but let's, I just want to make sure we're on the same page. If, so on, on upside, if, I'm, if what I'm trying to do is accomplish the equivalent of computing via other means, yeah, there could be some very interesting other means. Uh, I mentioned approximate computing, for example. It's one of the things we're looking into. Um, it turns out there's, there's lots of places that are of interest to the military, at least, and I suspect this would be true of commercial as well, where you have, say, a camera in the sky looking down at a, maybe it's a hostile environment, um, and it's trying to track people. Or, or trucks or something, and then that information gets sent to some analyst on the ground who's standing, you know, looking at a screen. Well, that screen, the, the connection of that screen to the people's eyeballs, we're, we're spending, like we take a pixel off that camera and we effectively stick it into like a, a double precision number. Um, I don't know if that's literally true, but suppose it is. Uh, now you've got 64 bits conveying a value that really only has meaning to about, I don't know, six bits worth of, con of precision. So the, the idea was, if you, you, if you can get by with uh, uh, an engine in between that camera and that person's eyeballs that takes advantage of the fact that we don't need all those bits, uh, and you can only give an approximate answer and it's just as good, uh, it turns out there's a couple orders of magnitude energy efficiency available to you at that point. And so we're chasing that down because we have a lot of applications like that. Uh, so yes, I do think that's really important and very promising. That's, a, that's one example I can think of right now. There's another example I can think of um, where people are looking at arrays of spin torque oscillators. Uh, if you've never paid attention to this, if you, if, I don't mean the speaker or the questioner, but if any of you have never paid attention to this, if you take oscillators and you put them nearby and they have any way of transferring energy back and forth, they sync up because that's the, that's the lowest energy for the system. And there's a neat YouTube video where there's 32 musical metronomes sitting on a table that's, that's, that's able to move just a little bit. And some hand comes in and just makes them all you know, routinely, sort of randomly do this. And within a couple minutes, they're all in lockstep. And that's because they've all sort of reached the lowest energy state for that system. And the point is, if I take spin torque oscillators, say 64 of them at a low level, and I set up the initial conditions that correspond to a, program, a, a problem that I care about, I can let them settle to a lowest energy state, take the energy state out, and, it's, and that energy state corresponds to a partial solution of my problem. Um, and it, happen, it happens fast, um, it happens with very low energy, it does happen probabilistically. <laughs> So there may be an issue of, you know, are, are you happy with the probabilistic answer? But all the quantum computing people, always, they, they already have that problem. Um, so yeah, we're, we're actually putting some bets on the table in terms of research that, that uh, there's stuff out there that at least looks promising enough to explore. Uh, and so we have a, a fair amount of money chasing those questions right now for the next, say, three or four years. I had very good friends, have very good friends who worked on the 432. And admittedly... Um, Conrad's here today. <laughs> yes. I don't see Justin yet. <laughs> anyway, uh, the execution was abysmal and the performance was worse. But you mentioned there's an attractive idea there. And actually, I have a processor based on abstractions or separation of concerns. So my question is, do you think in this age of the duopoly <laughs> that there's any hope for a new architecture based on abstractions with two provisos? One absolute backwards compatibility. We learned that from the Itanium. <laughs> hmm. Absolute, that's Proviso 1. And Proviso 2, it has to natively outperform the x86 and the ARM. If you could do those two things, have some abstractions, is there any hope? Do you, uh, how wedded to, are you to the uh, uh, backward compatibility thing? Like, can I fake that with uh, software if I want to? Oh, absolutely. You know, performance is golden. If you can run the x86, okay, at speed, 
I don't care if you use software, firmware, middleware, or hardware, yeah. okay, as long as you don't blow, bu blow your, your area up or power budget, I don't care how you do it. Yeah. Just do it. <laughs> I would love to say, yeah, I, I think this would be great. I think someone is going to wake up and think this is great. I, I actually don't. And the reason is I, the, 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 the way that I look at it is it would require somebody at a high level at a place like Intel to say to themselves, I, need, I have some compelling reason that that kind of a machine needs to exist. And if it does, I'll be able to make a huge profit. I don't see how they're going to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Is it, competition the, with the Chinese sufficient motivation? Uh, maybe. But then, well... They have to be afraid. <laughs> yeah, there has to be right. fear they're somewhere very here. Afraid. <laughs> uh, that's the problem. If you're if you're kind of in the in the lead, if you're the lead horse for too long, you might lose your fear. Yeah. Fear and paranoia aren't quite the same, all right? And they definitely have paranoia. But oh yes, <laughs> fear is not really. Um, yeah, maybe. If so, but but here's how it works. Intel. I hate to keep picking Intel. But it's the only one I really know. Uh, Intel. I, I for my tastes is terrible at anticipating. Just terrible. They can't, they don't, in my opinion, they don't look down the road and say, hey, five years from now, the rules will be different. I need to react today. I'm going to put other bets on the table allowing for that. There's, not, there's some of that, but not a lot. But what they are really good at is reacting. So, How much punishment does it take? Uh, it, 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 it varies. Um, <laughs> for example, I was there when the, uh, the Celeron fiasco happened. And what, what that one was, was around the era of the Pentium III, um, People were approaching, Cyrix in particular, was approaching Dell and some of the other captive Intel houses and saying, uh, we, we have this chip and admittedly it's not as fast as Intel's, but it's really, really cheap. And, it's, you, know, and, and you should build something around the fact that it's cheap. And, and they started taking that seriously. And so Intel went into this huge panic and said, uh, what are we going to do? We can't react that fast. We can't go starting a brand new design to react. So, so they chopped the cache in half. They just turned it off. It's the chips, the transistors were still there. And, and so people like, you know, Microprocessor Report caught on to this. And, <laughs> and, and oh, incidentally, the engineers inside the company hated it. I mean, engineers hate that kind of stuff. We, we were aghast at the idea that you would have functional, perfectly good functionality that just was being turned off. Um, I had the same feeling as when I watched, I watched an IBM guy show up once. Uh, we paid, I forget which startup company I was at. They, we paid them to come and um, double the speed of our printers. And he opened the little door and flipped a switch and closed it and right. left. Yep. Right. And you go. We discovered that at the AI lab without their help. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's the that's the best way to do it. Um, yeah, I don't know. I it, it, the other aspect is that somebody high up who makes the kinds of financial decisions that affect billions of dollars would also have to understand at some fairly deep level the implications of an architecture. I can tell you, Intel's not such a place. Um, there are people that understand chips like nobody's business. Um, Dottie Perlmutter, for example, but. Uh, um, if, you, if, you wanted, if you went to him and tried to make the sale and say, look, we're going to make a, a, a compatibility, an object-oriented capability kind of machine, uh, first you'd have to distinguish it from the 432 or they would be dead on arrival. Right. Um, but <laughs> Don't if you manage, go there. <laughs> exactly. Because some of them have long memories. That's right. Um, and incidentally, that's not why the chip failed, as you said. It's, it was for Partly other reasons. That's why it's failed. Self-inflicted yeah, wounds. Understand capability systems worth beans, but never mind. And, and the technology wasn't, wasn't quite wasn't ready quite for ready. that level of, of uh, implementation. But... But I'm having a hard time seeing who's running that company, as an example, who would bake all those things together and come up to the conclusion that they had to do something so radical. Because they'd be putting a bet on the table that wouldn't pay off for, what, uh, seven years? It would take a while to get mm -hmm. everything to take advantage of it. And I think instead, the path of least resistance which, that they're on now is going to be so compelling that uh, I can't quite picture the circumstances under which they would change. But, I, but like you, I think there's a, a real promise in those kinds of machines, and I think we're going to have to take another look at them. Thank you. Hi, so as technology scaling runs out and we hit uh, seven nanometer or whatever it is in 2020 or 2022, can't the costs to make the transistors continue to fall over time? Has anyone done a study of the cost of 45 nanometer transistors from the first year they were made to uh, people that are doing 45 nanometer today, for example? Um, there's, you know, the, the fabs will have been amortized, the research will have been amortized, and mm. do we enter an era of cost optimization in the fabs that continues to exponentially cut the cost of the transistors, even though they don't get any better? Thank you. Yeah, they do, up to a point. Uh, you, you, but you have to assume something about demand. Uh, there has to, if, if you will posit, as part of your question, that there is a continuous, unexplained demand for 45 nanometer parts, then I think you're absolutely right up to the point where your yields are going to get to the high 90s, and then you're done. 
it's not clear to me that you're, you know, that you're going to do a whole lot better after that. Well, as costs come down, then we can put, for example, the circuitry in your cell phone into more and more small gadgets. We can have all kinds of really inexpensive devices that are smart, as, okay. just as an example. Sure, but, but I think you're also assuming that the people that make the tools at 45 nanometers um, have some assurance of continued demand such that they continue their development to sell you a machine that's going to do a better job and make your transistors cheaper. Um, I, I don't have a deep insight as to what status those guys are in right now or whether they would make such a bet. I do know that when they're trying to push the upper limit right now, uh, they're, in, they're hurting. They're, it's, it's really hard to push below 22 right now, and they're, they're all going nuts trying to do it. Um, so they would be very tempted if you had a, a proposition that said, hey, you could live on 45 for a well, good long 45 time. 45 is just an example. Uh, I'll pick 22. It's something we can do now. Yeah. So whenever we get to the limit and we just can't, the physics says we can't make those devices practically any smaller. I think we could still see exponential reduction in transistor cost over the decades that follow. Uh, I don't know about decades, but long time, yeah. But, but I think another word you want to throw into that argument is commoditization. It's like if you're into that, if you're into the game where you, you know your your primary interest is in shaving pennies on on the uh, chips you're sending out, uh, you're you're selling commodity parts at that point, um, and that's just not that that's a bad thing. I mean, the DRAM guys have done it for many years, but the microprocessor guys have not, um, and so I think that's going to be a rude shock if they ever have to live on the kind of margins that uh, that uh, certain other industries and DRAM in particular has had to suffer. Um, but yeah, it's a perfectly plausible future. In fact, if, if Moore's law ends, we're going to keep making chips. Uh, they're just not going to be noticeably better than their predecessors, in which case the temptation to work on cost savings is going to be enormous. I'm just saying I, th I think there's a, I suspect there's practical limits to that, because they already work on that pretty darn hard. So. Thank you. Um, so thinking about when Moore's law ends, in some sense, you could say that Moore's Law is one of the things that makes semiconductors and computers unique from, say, cars, sailboats, airplanes, right? And so, in some sense, I think about this from an economic perspective as saying, you know, this is just going to look like the automotive industry in 30 years, and, you know, maybe I'll be able to get a house in Los Altos for the same price as a house in Detroit, hopefully. <laughs> Good luck with that one. Um, I mean, so, you know, and, and, you know, our cars do get better. Right, but it's you know very incremental. So you know, do you think that that is a trajectory that you might see? It's funny you should pick on cars, David, because I think the auto industry, when Moore's law is going to end, they're going to suffer the most. I think if you look at the last 30 years of cars, what where have the innovations been? Engine controllers, anti-lock brakes, nav systems, radios, uh, and now they're going to put guidance systems in like the Google cars, and, yeah. and I think that's all really cool. But all of it's based on computers, yeah. and so it, you know. Uh, when we, if we stall out, what are they going to do differently from generation to generation? I think they can coast for a while. I'll give them an extra 10 years. But with, I think they've been living off the electronics for the last 20 or 30. And if we don't continually feed them you know, huge increases, it's not clear to me what they're going to do next. Mm. So I, I think it's backwards, frankly. But we'll see. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I'm standing between you and lunch. So uh, if there's no more questions, I think we should declare lunch. Thank you.